So we're here at the Linaro Connect, and uh, who are you? Uh, my name is James Bottomley. This is my badge. And uh, so, uh, what do you do? I work for IBM Research as a distinguished engineer. My primary day job is actually focusing on container technologies in the Linux kernel that assist us with the IBM cloud. Um, but actually at Lenara Connect, I'm talking about some of my more hobby projects, which is uh, code that I've been working on for a long time that assists me in my day-to-day -day job uh, uh, working with Linux, doing other things, but is not actually part of the kernel code, which I have tried over various uh, different attempts to get upstream into some of the various projects. So I'll be introducing some of what I've done, some of the things it enables, uh, my trials and tribulations trying to get it upstream, and um, the person who persuaded me to do the talk thinks it might be encouraging for uh, people just starting out in the open source community, especially at Amaro, to see that even if you have 20 years experience as a kernel developer, once you switch projects, it's just as difficult for you as it is for everybody else. So. Um What's the problem? Uh, the problem is that um, open source is a very open process, as the name implies, but once a project becomes mature, there's a sort of inbuilt barrier of resistance to um, taking code that actually comes from outside the project. And it's it doesn't seem to be anything conscious, it seems to be more on a, a set of unconscious biases. But that makes it very difficult for people who have a mission which is just one particular patch set. And the, the fundamental basis of open source was supposed to be scratching your own edge, which means that as a person coming to an open source project, you pull it in, adopt it, think it's wonderful for a while, then you find that one rough edge that really annoys you. And as time goes by, it's the thing you keep on rubbing up against. And eventually you get so annoyed by it that you pull the source code apart, because being open source you can, you find what the problem is and you fix it. And then you put it back together and for you the rough edge has gone away. And for a lot of people that's the end of this interaction. But there's another step in that interaction, which is where you try to inform upstream of what this particular problem was, why it bothered you, and how you fixed it. And a lot of times that makes you what's called a drive-by coder. Um, perhaps the term drive-by, especially with all the shootings in the US, is becoming a bit cliched, and we should perhaps use the term something like single issue coder instead. But what it means is that you don't necessarily, you care about the project as a user, but as a coder, you only care about this one particular thing that you had to fix and now you're intent on getting it upstream. And a lot of times when you come to a project with just one patch, um, they look at you and go, but you have no history with the project, you don't know what our processes are, chances are you submitted the patch wrongly. So you, you get this barrage of things that you did wrong that you have to try and correct. And it becomes a fairly monumental hill to try and climb just to get your one patch in. And um, I'm not really providing a solution or a panacea for this problem but because there isn't one, but I'm calling attention to it because there are a lot of people who are in the same boat and I want them to know that they're not actually alone. So there's no solution from you? There are. Is it possible that somebody has, can come with a solution? There, there's no generic solution. Part of the solution is trying to interest the project in what you're doing. So if you can interest the project, project in what you're doing and they see it as valuable to them, um, everything becomes a lot easier for you. So I'm actually in my talk giving an example of this. So um, some of my hobby projects are uh, enabling of what's called a TPM, a Trusted Platform Module. It allows you to perform secure functions with keys that cannot actually be exfiltrated from the platform, which is a very useful way of storing your secure shell keys and your GPG keys and everything else. So it turned out that last year I met up with Werner Koch, who is the GPG maintainer. He was actually very interested in some of the stuff I've been doing with TPM and encouraged me to do it for GPG, with the result that in his tree I actually have a drive-by branch for my TPM code. But that's basically one success and pretty much a sea of failures. So it's not a generic uh, how you do this thing, it's just a how I managed to do it in one particular case. I still haven't found the generic use case that works for everybody. And I suspect because of the diversity of open source projects, a generic use case doesn't exist. So uh, what do you do at IBM? At IBM, my day job is actually, um, I, well, I'm a distinguished engineer. So a distinguished engineer is the 
an engineer who's actually on the lowest executive rung. So your, your job is to care for projects that, uh, for, from an executive standpoint, which means giving advice and counsel and trying to move others forwards um, within IBM research. So right at the moment, what I'm looking at are uh, container security technologies. The one you may have heard of, but if you haven't heard of it, you can easily Google for it, is Nabla Containers, which is a secure runtime experiment for containers that actually produces a container that is more secure than a hypervisor, which we think is a very useful property given some of the propaganda that's going on in the industry. More secure than a hypervisor? Yes, at least by the benchmarks that we evolved. Part of running this project was actually trying to give an objective measure to what we think of as security. So that was the first part of the project, and the second part was actually creating a container description that would have a highly secure profile as measured by this uh, uh, measurement that we actually gave. So, um, is that a big deal for everybody in the, in the world, if there was something more secure in terms of uh, what you're doing? I think, in terms of what I'm doing, this is more uh, a research project, but that doesn't mean we can't productize it, and there does seem to be a lot of desire in the world for a container which has security characteristics that both match and exceed that of a hypervisor, so I'm hopeful this will actually be useful in the future, yes. And uh, what have you done before? Uh, before that, uh, you mean a long time before that, before I got Anytime. into containers, yeah. I was, uh, I still am technically a Linux SCSI subsystem maintainer. So before that, I worked mostly on storage devices, and I also helped found a company that did high availability for Linux a long time ago. High availability? Yes. Uh, what does that mean? High availability is where you run uh, two programs in parallel, and if one goes down, the other one takes over. All right. Uh, so, uh, when you think about uh, Linaro, uh, have you had some involvement with the Linaro people? I have to confess that I haven't actually been to Linaro Connect since I gave the keynote in Dublin in 2013. That was one of the first ones, right? Yes. The keynote was about, it was comparing um, ARCH64 to the failure Intel had with Atania and worrying that they were committing some of the same mistakes. So it was a slightly unpopular keynote from ARM's point of view, if I remember rightly. Did they, com did they do any of the same mistakes or did they listen to you and they didn't? I don't think they listened to me. I think they didn't commit all of the same. I mean, Itanium is definitely a dead architecture, whereas ARCH64 is still viable. So it's still, it's sort of not in the Itanium bucket. But I, I think ARCH64 is still struggling, yes. Still struggling? Yes. So what do they need to do? It's actually very hard to say. I mean, Grant and a lot of the other people are talking about things that they really need to do, which is get a standard description. It's enormously helpful to Intel. The PC has a standard description that spans sort of laptops to, through to servers. And I know ARCH64 tried to do this, but the community seems to be slightly fragmenting again when I look at what's going on with the, the boot projects and the boot descriptions and everything else. So I think pulling that back together and making it as easy as possible on the OEMs would be a great, first, uh, a great step in the right direction. Um, the other thing really was, back in 2013 when I, when I was doing this, the thought that ARM would take over from Intel was really based on the power consumption. And what happened there is what usually happens in the industry. When you specifically call out one feature in your competition, the competition immediately ups their game. So Intel upped their game with the power descriptions for Skylake and the architectures beyond that. So the power footprints are now actually very comparable. ARM doesn't really have the power advantage anymore. So the next thing you need to do is find another advantage and uh, exploit that instead. You can't treat your one advantage as something that you'll have for all time. You have to treat your own advantage as sort of a temporary thing which will be replaced by something else yet. And I haven't actually heard ARM articulate coherently what its next greatest advantage over Intel is now that the power one doesn't really exist. Maybe it's something to do with customization doing something different somewhere. <laughs> well, customization is an interesting one, but it's also an Achilles heel. Uh, if you've heard about the Linux desktop, um, it's often thought that the reason no Linux desktop really exists in mass market form, if you exclude sort of tablets and smartphones, everybody was thinking of laptops, is basically because there was so much choice. 
in terms of a desktop, consumers do not like choice. Therefore, customization as a, an advantage is a double-edged sword. And uh, you were mentioning power, and IBM is famous for the power. So how did IBM do with the power? Power is still one of our most profitable centers at IBM. It's still the architecture that runs the enterprise. But obviously, power customers have an eye to the future. So part of what I do as my day job at IBM Research is look at opportunities to get power into the cloud. And one of the great things about having your own uh, CPU group, which we do at IBM, is that if you look at what happened with the virtualization technologies like hypervisors, it was actually CPU assistance to hypervisor functions that really helped them break into the mainstream. Because before they broke into the mainstream, every, everybody was on with the Zen power virtual descriptions where the actual kernel that booted on your hypervisor had to be a different kernel from what you actually boot on the physical system. Once hardware acceleration came along, that was no longer a problem. So one of the things that I can look, actually look at in IBM research from a blue sky point of view is what are the CPU enhancements that are actually needed for containers to uh, get the same advantage that hypervisors got from the CPU. It turns out that's actually much harder than uh, what it was for hypervisors, but we're still looking at it actively. All this stuff that, I mean, I'm not an expert, I just try to do videos, right? But uh, all this stuff that has to do with virtualization and containers and all that, doesn't it mean that uh, m maybe the architecture doesn't matter as much? Well, containers is definitely the architecture doesn't matter that much because hypervisors were based on a, a hardware description emulation. So you required the hypervisor itself to be embedded in the hardware. Containers lifts that up a level. If you think about it in terms of ABI, the, the unbreakable ABI for the hypervisor was the hardware description. It was the, the VMM, the virtual machine monitor that emulates the hardware. The unbreakable description for containers is the kernel syscall ABI. It's actually that so there are two interesting things to ask about this. Number one is, is that as high up the stack can we go? Is there another higher ABI that we could actually make the basis of some future virtualization that goes beyond containers? So that's one interesting thing that I'm looking at. And obviously, if you're wondering what that ABI might be, it would probably be the glibc ABI. So there's a question of whether we can raise containers up to that. Um, and then there's another question of, um, once you've raised the ABI up, as you alluded to, what, what the hell goes below it? So with containers, Honestly, Linux is the only thing that really goes below containers. But if we lifted it up to the libc ABI, it's not entirely clear that Linux would be the only thing that goes be, uh, below it. And so there might actually be an interesting opportunity for alternative architectures in this sort of future container world. And what could that be? I honestly don't know, because nobody succeeded in producing this future container description yet. So it's merely speculation that it can exist. There are reasons why it might not be possible. Containers, if you look at them, was an accident of the fact that Linus Torvalds was so uh, dead hot on Linux not breaking the system call ABI. If he hadn't done that, we'd be in the same difficulty producing container descriptions as Windows is. And in fact, containers would probably not have been a thing today if he hadn't concentrated with a laser-like focus on keeping the kernel ABI backwards compatible. So it's, it's, it's not entirely clear to me that I can make the same thing happen with the libc ABI, or there is some ABI above the kernel, perhaps not libc, perhaps in some scripting language, that we can also make the same promise for. But it seems to be this backwards compatibility, this hardness of the ABI, is what's required to bring up the next generation of container descriptions. Why is it so hard to, to get this done? Is it like uh, some kind of a magic algorithm nobody has figured out yet? or is it, no. does, Don't you know exactly what the, the steps to do to get this done? Like, not really. The problem is that the ABI itself is not as hard as people think it is. And if you look at why Windows failed at this, it's a very good reason. Engineers like workarounds. They think that if, when, when they see a problem, the first instinct is to work around it. So in Windows, what they did was first work around for something that didn't work in user space was to fix the kernel to make it work. And that then ties the kernel very tightly to the user space and means that what we can do in Linux, like bringing up an Ubuntu Docker image on top of a Red Hat kernel can't be done in Windows. You can't bring up a Windows 7 uh, Docker image on a, you know, a Windows NT or a Windows 9 kernel because the actual uh, ties between the software, the, the user space and the kernel are too tight. So we know what the problem is, but once you've got all that history, it's very hard to go back and fix it. Uh, who's going to be able to find, find a solution? Are you doing it? Somebody else? 
Well, I'm looking at it from uh, at least in part of my research time at IBM, and I imagine there are lots of other people looking into this as well, because the potential rewards from actually fixing it would be interesting, but it's not clear to me that it can be done yet. We haven't actually, in IBM research, managed to produce a coherent description of the libc level for a container. And all these containers and virtualization, all that stuff, is there a lot of optimization that goes into that? Like, uh, you want to take uh, advantage of the full CPU and all that hardware that's down there, right? You, uh, or is that part of it? That is part of it. I mean, CPUs exist primarily as agents for executing the will of the programmer. And in, as far as most CPUs are concerned, the will of the programmer is written in machine code. But the number of people who program in machine code nowadays is very, very tiny. So we've evolved this entire sequence of ecosystems that sort of do all of these translation layers above it. But obviously, as we try and lift the ABI up, that separates us enormously from the CPU. So either we do something to bridge the gap from the software point of view, which could be done, but it's not very likely, or the CPU people wake up and do something to bridge the gap from their point of view, which would be additional CPU enhancements that would actually support container descriptions. Cool, and I, I guess there's a lot of other, very, where, where are you based? I'm based in Seattle. Uh, are there a lot of cool things happening with your colleagues around there? Uh, most of my colleagues are in Yorktown Heights, which is where the TJ Watson Research Lab is. So I spend a bit, quite a bit of my time uh, either communicating with them on video or actually going to visit the TJ Watson Lab. Which is, uh, is that the other side of the US? Yes, uh, it's in uh, New York State, near Yorktown Heights. So there's a lot of people there doing interesting things. Yeah, IBM has several thousand people in IBM research doing all sorts of interesting things, not just cloud. We do things like quantum computing, um, where the, the cognitive, the deep thought programs are also coming out of there. Uh, we do an amazing amount of research. It's a fun it's place It's also to IBM work. who's designing the next generation ARM processors, right? In oh, partnership well. with ARM, uh, doing a 5 nanometer, 7 nanometer, all this stuff. Sometimes um, that's uh, I've done videos before before with somebody from IBM was like partnering and doing lower nanometers, you know, helping the the, the fabs get better. Well, I've heard that people are doing that. I honestly didn't know that we had a partner with ARM to assist them. Um, it is well known that going beyond sort of the 14 nanometers to 10 nanometers, it's becoming steadily more difficult. I've got to say that this is really far away from my area of expertise, so I shouldn't be pontificating on it, but. Um, yeah, right. IBM does lots of interesting stuff. Come and join.